Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. I am your host, Robbie Burke, and I'm joined on today's show by Kier when I'm flat from rubbystrengthcoach.com. On this episode, Kier and I have an in-depth conversation about physical preparation for speed power sports. This is an absolutely outstanding episode with Kier, guys. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. All right, Kier, we are recording, sir. It is savage to finally catch up with you. Um, something I do want to do before you give us a little update. In your intro, I want you to give me like this fucking around the world journey because I want to know what skeletons are in your closet, man. You've been yeah. to L- London Wasps, <laughs> then you went to fucking the, the Roosters in Sydney, then the whole Argentina gig, fought in the World Cup, bastards about Ireland. Uh, we had loads of injuries, though. Um, and then you went to Toshiba in Japan, and now you're at the University of Richmond with Jay. So, like, give us the fucking the story there, and that's unreal. Half, half by accident, half by design. Um, I think you and I last spoke maybe three or four years ago. I was living in Sydney then. Um, now, basically, the story was that I'd always, you know, like by the time I was 15, I realised I was, you know too short, fat, white, slow, unathletic, unskilled, tell, not brave enough to be a pro t- player. <laughs> tell the audience what that coach said to you. You, you said it on Mike Robertson's show. He goes, care, something about like not Yeah, being he goes, they're looking for big, strong, fast rugby players. And unfortunately, you are none of those things. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> it, it, the writing was on the wall then. And I decided, right, I'm going to be a strength conditioning coach. Um, you know, I've gone into detail on other podcasts why... It, it took me so long to do that, but eventually I did get an internship that turned into a job with London Wasps. Mm. And my ex-girlfriend at the time, she uh, is Australian, well, you know, was, is Australian. And there were, there were events that transpired at Wasps. And one of the things that I'm, I actually tell coaches all the time now is, is Academy work is extremely rewarding. It's probably more rewarding than adult first team work. But the thing about the academy is, is that in many clubs, you'll be viewed as a second class citizen and it will be a limiting factor to you when you try and apply for adult jobs or say, oh, but he's just an academy guy. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen it happen to a lot of people where they get put in, the, put in a certain box and they, they end up being in that job for a number of years. And not only does it hurt their professional progression, it's obviously going to hurt them in the pocket as well because it's, it's very, very rare um, that academy jobs are well-paid and that they're just as well-paid as the senior jobs, even though they should be. So there were, there were movements at Wasp that basically meant everyone was going to be in that job for the next five years. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be a 30-year-old academy strength conditioning coach because you know, then I'm in the box and I've, I've yeah. sacrificed X amount of years to not get paid. So Plus, plus the salary is shit, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it was at the start of the third year, they paid me 25000 which oh. to live in West London. And you've, you've, you've had a year of nothing, a year of ten grand, mm. and then you basically you get the, the opening wage that you get to be a, a trainee at Aldi. <laughs> yeah. even though you're you know one of the top 10 clubs in the country so we made the decision to move to um australia because i said i used to joke you know if i'm going to be poor i'll be poor with a tan and, um, <laughs> and then it just you know the, the argentina thing was by accident but i i definitely cultivated relationships with them and i was still in contact with the people doing that job and right place right time but then there, there was a degree of I was absolutely willing to drop everything and fly to Argentina on like two days' notice. Mm-mm. So, and you told the, you, you told the girlfriend at the times I'd be gone either for a week or three months, and it was three months. It was three months, and then you know that was the beginning of the end of that relationship. Uh, but then the Roosters thing again, half luck, half cultivation. I, I had gone around every single club that I could when I first arrived in Sydney, and kind of said, you know, here I am. This is my background. I'm not asking you for a job. All I'm asking you to do is tell me when the next opening becomes available so that hopefully I can apply. Mm. And, you know, unsurprisingly, very, very standoffish when I first arrived there. As soon as I'd done this three-month 
gig where I'd filled in for someone with Argentina, they, they said, oh, you know, we've got this under 20s gig. Would you be interested in applying? Yeah, yeah. And then I got that and you know, I've kind of, again, other places I've spoken about what a disaster that was. Um, just on a, a number of levels, uh, I, I resigned after six months just because I made the decision that certain things were more important to me than other things. And the other things that weren't important to me, I decided was money, stability, and um, what people thought of me. So mm -hmm. what, what was more important to me was autonomy, doing good work that I believed in and um, feeling like I mattered. So mm -hmm. I, I went back to Argentina and then, you know, like you said, the rest is history kind of thing. I, I saw out another two seasons with them. And I actually, I'm not sure if it's public or not, but I'd agreed to head up the national team and the super rugby team that's going on now. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd agreed in principle to another three years moving to Argentina. And uh, yeah, just to confirm that thing about the money, I think they, on, on paper, they'd offered me a pay cut after the World Cup to, to stay. And obviously my cost of living would have gone down, but in, in gross terms, they offered me a pay cut to stay. And I actually agreed just because, uh, you know, you're riding that emotional wave after the World Cup and yeah, uh, yeah, I agreed yeah. to it. But then there was, there was a number of contractual things that didn't work out. Basically, a non-compete with Exos they tried to cut Exos out and I kind of stepped away and said, well, you know, I'm not going to break this non-compete. And even if I had, I would, it would have worked out that I couldn't have worked for them. So uh, just purely by luck, an agent had, um, had contacted me prior to the World Cup and said, you know what you're doing next year? And I said, I've got no idea. And um, once that situation had transpired, I, I spoke to them and they, they hooked me up with the team in Japan. So I thought, all right, I'm going to move. I actually signed with another club in England. I'd uh, signed with Ealing. Who have, who have since gone very, very well. So it shows, you know, uh, they didn't necessarily need me. Um, but I, they, they actually let me cancel that contract and, and move to Japan okay. on, on account of the money. I basically said, you know, they've offered me 300% of what you're offering me. Can you match yeah, it? And yeah. they said no. And I said, well, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, to cancel that contract. And to be fair to them, they let me go. And then, you know, I think... You know, speaking frankly, because I'm, you know, I'm done with rugby now. Um, yeah, you're 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 going you're going for an NFL gig now, aren't you? Basically, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm I'm not shy about saying that's what I want to do. Um, but too too fucking right, man. If that's what yeah. you want to do, fucking go for it. Yeah, and J Japan really took what little enthusiasm I had for rugby, and that was it. So mm -hmm. I decided. I signed a two-year deal. I decided by the end of the first, I was not going to renegotiate to stay. And basically, I kind of put into overdrive my, my efforts to yeah. um, position myself here. And the, actually, they kind of happened at the same time, but the, the Richmond gig came after the visa. So I was going to be coming out here, working exclusively for myself to basically on a number of different contracts and stuff. But mm, mm. Uh, I ended up getting the job at Richmond. Here Sweet. I am. Sweet. <clears throat> tell me about how to win friends and influence people and never eat alone and why they were a big impact on you. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things like failure is a very powerful teacher and I'd, I'd made the mistake of thinking that I could get by and um, in the industry, not, not to say, you know, not having friends and not thinking about how I approach that side of, of things, but I foolishly told myself, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm good enough, they'll just give me the job. Or if I do good enough work, they'll give me the job. And there's only so many times that you can miss out on a job um, where you believe you're the more qualified candidate and you do better work mm. for the penny to drop. Yeah. And all things being equal, people want to work with their friends. All things not being equal, people oh. still want to work with their friends. Yeah. And it's not... Some, some people look at developing a network as a, a, as a negative thing or being strategic about how you approach relationships as being manipulative, but it's not true. It's, it, what it is, is making sure that you are valuable to people and useful to people. Mm. And that, that serves them just as much as it serves you. But sometimes you have to, you have to think carefully about how you're going to demonstrate your value to people and making sure that you're putting money in that bank account of the relationship you have with that person that you can make a withdrawal if you need and just put your hand up and say, listen, I'm, you know, I'm going to ask you for help. And there's, there's been times in my career where I've literally just bring up people and said, no, I, I need some help, please. I need a favor. And um, you, you cannot take out with first putting in. And yeah. 
it just just being a little bit more deliberate about how you go about that and making sure that you have a good uh, foundation to to build from. And even even once you've got that job, those those same principles apply because you at at some point, if if you really want to win, you're going to have to have difficult conversations and difficult interactions with people, whereby you basically say you are not doing your job, you are not good enough right now at what you're doing. And you can be 100% right when you make that statement to someone. But if you do not have a good relationship, the barrier is going to go up and it's going to bounce straight back. Whereas if you have that, that deep relationship already and they understand this is for my good, it's for the good of the team. And I understand that you have my best interests at heart, then it, it becomes easier to accept and, and kind of build from. And that was actually a situation that we had in Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So I, I first came across you on strengthcoach.com. And it was a YouTube video series you'd done on physical preparation for rugby. Yeah. And that video series really resonated with me at the time because when I saw it, I said, this guy looks to be roughly my age. And he seems to be having the exact same challenges in rugby that I have in Gaelic games here in Ireland. And you were like speaking the same way I would speak presenting. You were like, you know, you were using terms that we always use. Like you were talking about bioenergetics and alactic and, why glycolytic works is, is like, for the most part, not the correct energy system or the correct work to be doing for alactic aerobic sports. I was like, he's saying alactic, he's saying aerobic. He knows who Verkashansky is. He knows who James Smith <laughs> is. So <clears throat> that really drew me into to, to starting to follow you. Um, initially, just through social media. And then, obviously, when you, had, when you had, now have Ruby Strength Coach, um, which we will link up in the show. It's a fantastic resource. Even if you're not a Ruby coach, if you're just involved in speed, power, sports, all the principles are applicable. So for American football coaches, soccer, any type of field and core play sport, that's still a great resource. Um, big pitch there. You owe me now. You can, you can pay. You well, can pay. actually, funnily enough, the, that money. I would say rugby, rugby coaches are in the minority of the membership on the community. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah, lot of, that, yeah. a lot of GAA, a lot of soccer, all that kind of stuff. Soccer, I've been in America too long, football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're soccer. Soccer. But uh, the topic, the main topic for today's discussion, um, I want to center around physical preparation for speed and power sports. Because um, as I said, now you're not a rugby, you're mainly with, with football. But I mean, the principles like are applicable across the board. Absolutely. So let's get into your whole training philosophy. And uh, I, I kind of, I love this because it's just like, it's a bit egotistical. It's like it's just like listening to me talk <laughs> because <laughs> it, it, we're very similar in our thought processes. Which, of course, is all, can be a danger in terms of like group thinking. People talk about that, but at the, the same echo time, chamber. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's always that's, hashtag UKSCA. Yeah, <laughs> hey, you know. Yeah, I will say that. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. need UKSCA now. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I know it's great. It would do the US. <laughs> they still go for the CSCS over there, though. Do they? Are they still still looking for yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah, which has weaknesses of its own. Oh, listen, listen, nothing's perfect. No one's perfect. None of us are perfect. As 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 the man himself said, he would have sin cast the first stone. Isn't that what he said? Your man that looked like one. Your man that looked like one of the beiges. Um, Jesus, by the way, a few people just in case you're not getting the reference. (laughs) All right, Kira, lash in there to that. So your your training philosophy. uh, Take it away for speed power sports. I think. I mean, the, the biggest. Thing I think you need to, it's like a Stephen Covey principle, which is one of the slowest books I've ever read, but it's, um, it's actually, that's one of, my fa- one of my favorite books, actually. But I, I know what you're saying, yeah. It took me a year probably to read because I just it was so boring, but yeah, anyway, begin with the end in mind, understand why, why you do what you do, and the, the, the fundamental goal of what we do is, is physical preparation coaches is to enhance performance on the field of play, yeah, and for your sport you need to define precisely what that is because if you can define it you can measure it you can record it you can track it and you can actually not know but infer whether what you're doing is is working and uh certainly for all field-based sports that's probably going to be a measure of speed uh, over distances that may vary according to position and, and sport and then there's probably going to be some other kind of uh, movements in there I know you speak to James a lot. James would say if you know your sport is probably sprinting and dot dot dot, whatever that dot 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 is, that's probably the stuff that you should be training for and to to try and improve and to try and measure. Mm. And you can also ask the question, what is it that my position does better than anyone else? What makes me tired the most when I'm on the field of play? Those are probably the key movements that you need to be trying to improve. And some of those movements are so um 
unique or, or so complex, it can be quite difficult to try and measure those directly. But then, you know, there are certain tools out there that may make that possible in the future. So things that spring to mind would be like a free motion on push band, even though Miladin Jovanovic, I just spent a week with him in Argentina. He absolutely savaged push band. So I'll let him pop. You can speak to him about that. But things like that, like the, the bar sensei in med ball, stuff like that, just trying to get as close as possible to yeah. the, the movement characteristics and force characteristics of the movement in a way that you can measure. If you can't, you have to try and use physical surrogates that allow you to get as close as possible to those that still allow you to test in a reliable manner where the, the smallest worthwhile change is bigger than the standard error, all that kind of stuff. Mm, mm. Once you've done that, um, what you have to do is try and concentrate all of your efforts on making those numbers improve. If those numbers uh, do not improve, you've essentially wasted your time. And the problem with this is, is when you look at the majority of on-field movements, they are a world away from the typical stuff that strength coaches like to hang their hat on. Yeah. Stuff like, one RM barbell lifts, um, mostly that stuff like power cleans, you get a little bit closer, other, other kind of Olympic movements. If you look at the criteria, which makes an exercise specific or not, according to Verkashansky, mm -hmm. magnitude and direction of force, range of movement, muscles used, uh, movement velocity, contact time, regime of muscular work, and to an extent, energy system. They are so different from what you see on the field of play. Um, Though those movements are not actually that specific, um, they don't predict very well, if at all, ability in those movements. And to try and hang your hat on those without concerning yourself with true KPIs in your sport is a waste of time, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It, it just uh, inflates the ego and it helps people to justify their existence because those, those numbers are easy to improve and they're easy to, to track. So I think fundamentally my philosophy is to try and concentrate on improving that stuff and if the the popular stuff that people like to hang their hat on is useful in that regard to make those numbers go up i'm going to use it and if and when it gets to a point in the athlete's career that that stuff doesn't transfer then i'm going to try and look for for other stuff which which is going to transfer to those those movements on field and you know you, you mentioned james smith you mentioned verkashansky the, the three big areas that we're looking to enhance uh, to achieve that is the biodynamics, the bioenergetics, and the biomotor abilities. Mm -hmm. So it's you know what are the what are the movement characteristics, what are the physical qualities that underpin it, and what are the metabolic qualities that underpin um, th those movements or the pattern of movements on the field of play. I always reminds I always reminds of the three Bs, like it's so like uh, like the three Bs from sort of. Our, our perspective being, well, James is going to kill me for saying physical preparation coaches, sports preparation coaches. Yes. Uh, but um, like, so you said there, the bio, bio, um, bioenergetics, biodynamics, and um, biomodal bio qualities. And then Sean Miskler has his three Bs then when it comes to skill acquisition, brain, bio, uh, biomechanics, and behavior. So just like these three yeah. Bs, it's just funny the way it pops up again. Okay, so that's a really good overview of, of your philosophy. Mm, let's go now to system what's your system then so that, that's your overarching philosophy so mm -hmm. that's kind of like your why tell us now the how so athlete comes to you or group of athletes what goes on from there is it a needs analysis what's the profiling like what actually does your um training of athletes look like on a day-to-day -day, mesocycle to mesocycle microcycle microcycle basis so you can you can go micro on this in terms of like you know session to week to meso to macro and then you can even start bleeding that into maybe longer term but when you've got someone for like four years at a collegiate level cool. okay so <clears throat> i think so i mean with with a needs analysis for, for sure you're going to do a needs analysis of your sport you're going to look at just one one thing too, Kier. If it makes it easier, because I know some people I interview like this like to do this. If you're like, oh, there's a slide I'd like to use, you can screen share away, and you can if you think that will help. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go that. See how it goes. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, profiling is is going to be useful because it tells you from. So, one one thing you have to you have to agree with is physical preparation is probably the least important of the four areas, physical, tactical, technical, psychological, in terms of determining performance. Mm -hmm. If you and me are, I do jujitsu, I'm going to use this as an example. If you do nothing but jujitsu for four hours a day and I do nothing but lift weights for four hours a day, you are going to beat me up every single time. Yep. That is the value of uh, technique relative to physical preparation. Mm -hmm. 
if all you do is jujitsu techniques in a closed environment, you never react and you never have to game plan or, you know, if X, then Y scenarios. And I do that and I, I've done just as much as you have, but then I put that into context and I, I you know, game plan. I'm going to beat you every single day. And that's mm -hmm. the value of tactics relative to technique because at the elite level, everyone has good technique. And if the second you get into a bad position, you just wilt mentally and I'm durable and I can concentrate on the task, react and, and be put under pressure and still execute my game plan. I'm going to win every single time. And that's the value of psychology relative to tactics. Mm. So in oh. preparation, all you're looking to do is achieve the bare minimum across the board in a variety of different physical qualities or, or movement patterns that just allow you to survive at that level. And then you can concentrate on the other stuff. Yeah. And I've spoken at length about, we had a guy in Argentina, he was an international number eight. Uh, he would get man of the match performances against elite level opposition like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. He had a back squat of 130 kilos at 105 kilo body weight, yeah. which is fucking garbage. But it was enough. <laughs> if you have to be six foot five to play in the NF, uh, to play in the NBA, being eight foot tall is not going to make you any better. It's just yeah. you have to be just as good, and then you concentrate on the other stuff. So that's where a needs analysis can be useful because you can look at your peers around you and say, well, if you're way below these numbers, obviously that's something you need to worry about. If you're way above those numbers, maybe it's not a concern, and then we just need to still try and improve, but not dedicate a ton of resources to it because it's not going to be a limiting factor. Mm. in terms of individual athlete profiling one thing i absolutely really don't like what's the like the circular profile i forget the name of it it's like it's basically like it kind of spikes out from a radius a spider, a spider graph that's it right inexperienced coaches look at those and they'll see a massive spike in one ability and a glaring deficiency in another ability and then in their mind they think oh we want to have the greatest possible area across all of these abilities because that's a weak point and we need to address it yeah it's not the case. but sometimes that weak point the reason it's weak is because they're so strong in another area and they've already got to a certain level because of those strengths and trying to address the weaknesses may actually come at the cost of development in the strengths and then you've actually taken away the thing that makes them so good in the first place. So I think to, to steal from someone like Jonas, Tari Dodu, you, you address a weakness until it becomes a non-glaring weakness. And then you concentrate on strength because elite performances come from a position of strength. You need to make an athlete more of what they are, um, not just average at a lot of things. Elite yeah. athletes are world-class at a couple of things and then good at or okay a bunch of stuff and just a real quick interjection i know from jonas and the guys at altus would you more focus on that weakness further away from in season and kind of bleed more towards the strengths towards the, the season the competitive okay and the same in the career as well i think most of what applies within a year's preparation for an athlete can apply to the career as well which yeah. is you're trying to address weaknesses in the early phases because it doesn't matter nobody cares about the results mm. but then when it gets to the business end absolutely it counts and this is not a time to be addressing weaknesses it's about learning how to take everything that you have and apply it in the most efficient manner possible to secure the result that you want in competition so you've done that then you're going to look at your sport you're typically going to to steal the charlie francis thing watch the ball not the game oh sorry watch the watch, watch the player watch, watch the player not the game so yeah. it's basically people make the mistake of rugby they watch rugby with a stopwatch and say oh ball in play 30 to 40 seconds oh ball out of play 30 to 40 seconds what we're going to do for interval training, we're going to go 100% for 40 seconds till we breathe out of our ass. We rest for 40 seconds and then we repeat again and again and again. Mm. But it doesn't, it doesn't take into account the fact that if you watch most players in a game of rugby, there is a ton of walking and jogging. And it's basically guys trying to save as much energy as possible until they get their opportunity and then they attack it with as much intensity as possible, as much speed, as much power as possible. And then they take their foot off the gas again. And this is one thing that I've been lucky to witness in person, which is the All Blacks. To, to steal from a, a guy that I worked with, he said, you play against the All Blacks and for 60 minutes, you think, well, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, you think you're doing really, really good. And he said, they're just figuring you out. They're just waiting to, they're trying to find that weakness. They're, the just, fuck, they're just fucking with you. Yeah, the second you make a mistake, intensity, gone. So there's, there's that. You're going to look at the key movements in the sport. You're going to use your knowledge as a coach to say, well, you know, what are the, the criteria that make uh, those, those movements specific? Uh, you're going to look at the, the pattern of activity as well as the bioenergetics that underpin that. Mm. 
um, injury epidemiology for sure, because there's such a strong relationship between player available, availability and on-field success. So if there are uh, injuries which have a high frequency or a very high cost to player availability, which limit that, you're going to try and understand um, the, the underlying factors that cause those injuries, what you can do to mitigate that risk, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And then you start to develop your plan of how you're going to basically, um, if this is the, the desired state, this is the initial state of the athlete, what are you going to do to bridge that gap and, and basically progress that athlete from uh, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. Um, so a, a useful way to organize your thinking and this is the greatest advantage of, of going on something like an exos mentorship, in my opinion, is not that they're going to turn you into a world-class coach. You have to do that for yourself. But what they are going to do is provide you with a useful framework to organize your thoughts mm -hmm. and to clone yourself and clone those around you so that you're able to develop a system. And you can, you're welcome to do it any way you like. But the way that I tend to organize training activities for my athletes is uh, linear speed, agility, I call it special strength development. So jump throws and, and um, plyometrics, ballistic power, strength, accessory work, and then any kind of conditioning. And then for rugby, I would include an additional component of grappling. So you have to look at when you're going to organize those throughout the day. I would say if the closer you can get to like a high low Charlie Francis model of training, I think the reasons that people think thought it worked maybe being uh, disproven in, in recent months or years, but for some reason it works. Um, I have the numbers to back it up. Other people have the numbers to back it up. Maybe it's just because it's a polarized model of training in terms of training impulse. Mm -hmm. Maybe just psychologically it allows people to attack certain days, but I would say try and organize within the week, uh, high, low, high, low, high, low. Um, from Month to month, I think you just have to look at the most important times of the year and work your way backwards from those. So you're going to start with, you know, uh, general training means higher volume, lower intensity, because that's all that's necessary. And um, when it becomes necessary to introduce a stimulus, which is more intense or more specific, you're going to gradually phase that in. And then you're going to finish your preparation with the most specific, most intense elements um, with the greatest degree of uh, context to the sport, because it's all about realizing adaptation that's come before. Mm. Um, you can look at this differently depending on whether you're what I call a stopwatch sport with you know two, three or four peaks per year or you're a team sport where you have to maintain more kind of consistent level of preparation from week to week because the higher the peak, uh, the lower the trough. And that is not something you can afford to do when you're in a team sport. You absolutely can afford to do it in an Olympic sport because nobody gives a fuck what Usain Bolt is going to run the week after the Olympics. Yeah. And on, on a year-to-year -year basis, if you agree with the statement that general exercises decrease in their transfer to the field of play with every subsequent use, so it's just that, that curve of diminishing returns. Initially, there's going to be massive transfer, less, 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 up to a point of zero transfer to the field of play. You're left with three options. Increase the volume, four. Increase the volume, increase the intensity, increase the specificity, or increase the frequency of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. obviously you're going to try and use intensity volume and frequency first within that block and then you're going to treat them like an ace up your sleeve with more specific means um, to transfer to certain qualities on the field so just as you would tend to see a progression from more general exercises to more specific exercises um, specific to an athlete's stage of development within a year's preparation you would also see that within uh, preparation from year to year within the athlete's career. Yeah. So training activities for a kid of 12 is going to be very, very different to an elite athlete if we, if we consider, for example, um, team-based sports. So an elite level international pro who has been a pro for 10 years, the only thing that is going to make him a better rugby player is nothing physical. You've got all the gains that you're going to get out of him in terms of sprinting, jumping, cutting, all that kind of stuff. Really, it's going to be tactical execution, psychological preparation, and maybe just you know sharpening the sword in terms of, of technique. So mm. you're actually going to reduce the volume uh, of what you're doing and just tr basically try and maintain and then facilitate as much time as possible to, to concentrate on stuff that does work. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, obviously, there'll be times where the volume will go up and rugby will go down and vice versa. But that's going to be very, very different to the training of a 12-year-old kid uh, who's just got into the academy system with, uh, you know, let's say, Leinster. He's going to concentrate on 
long-term athletic development, multilateral development. So uh, is that player, he or she, able to control their body in all three planes of motion, one leg and two, variety of different movement patterns? Have they earned the right to use external resistance? external resistance are they learning how to run and change direction all that kind of stuff mm. and then basically there will be a lot of stages in between uh, whereby you're just generally seeing an increase in the intensity of what they're doing um, an increase in the specificity of what they're doing and uh, at times as well um, volume and frequency because at the end of the day the person who trains the most is probably going to develop the most and this is something that um, the Chinese have demonstrated again and again and yeah. Tim Gabbert has, has demonstrated in his research slightly different approaches the chinese just do it by chucking in 100 athletes and the 99 that break they get rid of and the one that survives is the one you see on tv so mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar to crossfit the the training that you see in or, or, you know the guys that you see in the crossfit games that's the guy that survived that's the cockroach that you cannot give enough volume and intensity to but generally speaking do more if you can do more you're probably going to be better mm. great stuff just on that uh that long-term sort of Athlete development, it's, it's something I've been discussing a lot lately. Uh, Pat Davidson, myself, and James Stewart from OPEX uh, speak about it a lot. Um, so we know early in an athlete's career, like, you know, the volume of general physical preparation is going to be a lot higher than specific physical preparation. And then, of course, as you alluded to, as they, as they become more qualified in their sport or as they attain more sports mastery, their training gets more and more specific. And as you alluded to there as well, it's like, there's this, I was always like, there's this paradox is in like, they need to do more and it needs to get more specific. But then it's just like, there's only so much they can handle. It's like, what happens when that burns out? And from studying like a bit of Franz Bosch, which we, we, we may tap into, and then from studying then a lot of other skill acquisition stuff. So, you know, um, Carl Newell's uh, constraints brace model where we talk about environment, organism, task, uh, Gibson's fucking ecological dynamics, and then also Boris uh, Shaco's powerlifting sort of system. And the way it kind of seems to go with Shaco is that you like it's kind of like the three three stages. Now I, I'm just this is my interpretation of it. Like so, and from talking to, from talking to Kevin Can, who's who's been trained underneath Shaco for the last two or three years in terms of his model, it seems that right you're a beginner, you just need like volume, work capacity, accumulation stuff. That mm -hmm. gets you to stage two then, where stage two is like, right, you've built up sufficient skill in the squat bench. Deadlift. Now we're just going to get you strong as shit. So it's purely quantitative overload. But, mm -hmm. then, but then when that starts to diminish in terms of, right, we can't push up your specific. And it's the other thing too, Pat Davidson made a good point. He was like, actually, elite at least their volume goes, their overall volume will actually go down, but their specific volume goes up. That's, he says that's where they get, that's For where sure. they get. And that's good. because, you know, a, a, an eight-year-old kid can run around the playground at full speed all day long, won't even touch him. Because they're saying, oh, right, he runs 100, he is going to empty the yeah. tank. And it's like, right, get him back in the pits, get under the bonnet and try and, you know, put him back yeah. together because the, the cost of activity is so high. And that's the paradox. You have to do more of the specific stuff, but the cost is higher. So actually the total volume is going to go down. Yeah. But the specific volume actually increased. So that's when that's Pat, it. when Pat said that to me, I was like, Oh, I never, never thought about it that way. Cause of course we know that, that, that GPP starts to, to lower in terms of importance and volume as someone gets more qualified. But then obviously there is going to be a diminished return to that as well in terms mm -hmm. of like how much quantitative overload can you, and then it's seen in the shake, in the shaker model. And then when I was studying the skill acquisition, it seems what the great coaches realize is that, that, that the only way to keep progressing then isn't intensity, isn't volume, but it's variation. It's, yep. it's now to challenge. It's now it's more about qualitatively overloading the system. And it's nearly more about instead of challenging the brain through physical, quantitative intensity, volume, low, like, you know, like having to like contract, it's now about getting the brain to figure out a movement solution. And that's another way to overload the system. So add more variation into the sport specific skills so with the powerlifters it was like okay now you're doing a deadlift with a chain or you're doing it with a little deficit or you're doing it in a different step but like minute variations that were still within your attractor state but were enough of a fluctuator to challenge you from a movement perspective which opened up your movement landscape which gave you a larger affordances and a perceptual landscape and then therefore that's basically the um yeah you know, allowed you to be better over speed under speed exactly yeah so 
that's kind of which is that how you're kind of thinking about longer term like development maybe in a way so it's it's kind of you know beginner then it's like volume intensity frequency that bleeds out and specific that bleeds out and then it's like into like variation until they reach like a biological age where now it's just, it's, I, I think the difference with the stopwatch sports is there is such a degree of control over everything the athlete does that you're far more likely to arrive at the point that that would be necessary. The yeah. thing about rugby. But Michigan, that, Michigan might disagree with that because in, in one of his office presentations, he kept reiterating, he says, and he says, even in track and field, you still need to have this repetition at repetition. Yeah, uh, like, absolutely. But you know, the, the, the point I'm getting to in, in the field-based sports is Obviously, I'm not perfect, but we do a, a very poor job in the field-based sports that that is almost not necessary. Like, yeah. I can go, there are, you know, I've worked with All Blacks that won the World Cup, X amount of tests for New, for New Zealand, won everything in the game, and they're still glaring errors in, yeah. in sprint technique or, or change of direction. It's like, yeah, yeah. Do, we, do we really need to add all these fancy tools to make someone better? I think it... I get you, yeah, I get you. It's, it's useful for variety, but... Truthfully, I've not, I've not been in a situation where I thought, man, I'm, I'm running out of things to make this guy better. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, if you're in a team where you've had an extremely long tenure, you've built your department around you, you know the system works, and you have athletes in the system for their entire career, potentially you would, you would arrive at that situation at the end, but... Well, I, I don't I, I don't even mean though like say and I don't know if, if you if this is how you interpret this I don't even mean like variation to their GPP work I mean like to their to their main sport but I suppose with field, sure. with field sports they already get they actually already get inbuilt variation as it is you know? they do they do so, the, the, so to a degree it's actually happening and we might not even realise we're doing it to an extent and then also you know it has to be weighed against as well the, the, the resources that you have available the staff that you have available and the time mm. that you have available mm. Um, if, if I, an example of where that might be the case that it would work would be someone like Cameron Joss at the Franklin's. So mm. he is working with elite level NFL guys, but he's working in a small enough group with time available and the knowledge and resources available to, to make that happen. You mean, uh, if, you mean, you mean Cam's still alive? That guy just went off the grid. It's great. Isn't it? <laughs> fair, play, fair play to him. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be an example of where it could happen. But I think, you know, if you look at, as an example, what we're doing right now, we have 60 plus football athletes. We're about to get another 15 freshmen. And uh, there's actually strict NCAA rules on the amount of time that you're allowed to have with the athletes yeah, per week. It's crazy. Uh, it's tough to do. It's yeah. tough to do. And then you get into creating the kind of organizational system wide change that allows you to do that. Yeah. And then it's, it becomes more of a question of, relationships organizational structure all that kind of stuff to make it happen mm. rather than you know your limiting factor being can you know can can we do it or do we have the money to do it right uh, i want you to touch on speed i want you definitely to touch on agility yep uh definitely touch on strength work because i love when you talk about strength work you can give some little stories from those japanese guys i used to love those facebook posts japanese guys because i don't feel strong okay let's test epr's do you still think you're not doing enough strength work yes yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so speed, agility, uh, definitely get into agility because again, this you know idea versus closed chain versus that really it's about you know it's more about perceptual. Uh, James calls James calls it, 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 it like neurophysiological sort of stimulus in in the book. Um, so, never use uh, two words, but five will do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so speed, agility, um, pa actually power work too. I want you to get your thoughts on power, strength, energy systems, and definitely if we can fit it in. And uh, listen, we can get you on some other time too. But I still want you to talk because I think you've done the best job in terms of making special strength exercises understandable. So let's go with speed there first. Okay. Well, you know, this is this is stolen. I would say this is stolen from Charlie Francis, Stuart McMillan, Dan Paff, Jonas Tawidodi, James, um, Sean Mishka to an extent. Um even though he, he put the delicious icing on a cake made of dog shit, Franz Bosch, uh, <laughs> Chris Corfist. By the way, I listened to you on Hyper Performance and, and I thought what you said about Bosch was very good, but we can, it, that might yeah. be a right? Go on, anyway. Corfist, Chris Corfist, right? Corfist, Tony Holler. I'm going to speak there next week, so I'm excited to, to finally meet up with those guys. Oh, you're at the Track and Field Consortium? 
I am, yes. Yeah. Somebody really? dropped out, so I am. Um, really? I'm cheap replacement. <laughs> Savage, well done. Yeah. Um, yeah, just go and speak at an event where Carl Lewis was the, uh, the keynote speaker. It's like, well, what, you, what you guys are doing wrong with speed is you need to do this. No kid. I'm actually, I'm speaking about hamstring injury uh, reduction. So I could uh, basically not have to tell a bunch of people much better than me what they're doing wrong. Nordboard, um, Nordboard. Fuck the Nordboard. <laughs> Soundbite. <laughs> so. Speed, man. It, it's kind of fractal. The same principles that apply to the sport as a whole apply to um, speed. Mm. Movement efficiency, motor potential, energy system development. Yep. Look at the research, energy system development is by no means the limiting factor to speed. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a question of how much potential do you have to apply force and what is your ability to apply that in the most efficient manner possible Brilliant. for the reasons of increased speed of movement, decreased energy cost, which makes the effort more repeatable in a repeat sprint task, plus putting your joints in safe positions with, which are gonna mitigate for non-contact non injury risk. Yep. Um, if you look at the research um, and the numbers, you know, I've, I've put up a webinar in my community literally the other day about this. I can tell you for a fact, our group in Toshiba, there was zero relationship between the jumps and the sprints and uh, one rep max in the barbell squat. And there was zero relationship even when we made it relative to body weight. Was there any difference between, like, was there anyone on the team that was like, like a young, young athlete and like, was this, was there any slightly more transfer to a younger athlete? Maybe, maybe. But it was still maybe. probably not even a huge difference. But well. I mean, this, this, this is my retort, which is the research, which leads people to conclude that a double body weight squat is the holy grail for speed and, and strength development is generated from research into college students who are recreational weight trainers who are yeah. not athletes in formal programs of preparation. Mm -hmm. So in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. If you've done nothing else and you've got a bigger squat than the other guy, well, we'd probably expect that to help. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about Japanese rugby players. There is zero attention to speed development that gets done in universities, even though they, they actually generate a lot of um, money and they attract players from Fiji and Tonga. It's basically a cottage industry. But you know, we had one guy with us, his, his in-season program at college was 10 sets of 10 on bench and 10 sets of 10 on squats in season. Yeah, Charles would be delighted. Yeah, so it should not be a surprise that the stronger athletes are a little bit faster because that's all you've got. Yeah. When you have a good ability to apply that, you know, you're going you're gonna to see differences arise. Mm -hmm. And so we saw no relationship. The, the biggest predictor we had of, of the 10-meter sprint was a peak V in a 60-kilo jump squat self-selected depth problem with that was there was no relationship between the one RM and the back squat and the, the jump squat. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, if we push up the squat, this is going to go up, this is going to go up, this is going to go up. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we saw a decent relationship-ish between RSI and the 10-minute sprint. We saw no relation. Oh, no, we saw a, uh, an even worse relationship with the, the vertical jump and sprinting. So basically, all of the heavy stuff that people say, oh, this is what needs to go up, it, it's going to predict um, performance in, the, in um, the jumps and the sprints. Just not true. Mm. and if you look at why that is the case there's a number of different arguments you can make why that's not the case one is the criteria of dynamic correspondence that Berk Shansky talks about yep. uh, if you, I think there was a stride by stride analysis of CJ Uja that Stuart McMinnell put up and it was a resisted sprint at Altus by step one he was already at five meters per second yeah. he's yeah. already outside of the velocity that you're going to see in the gym for any exercise whatsoever I think, I think by, by uh, I, cause I, I did an essay there for my master's this year in my biomechanics module. I, I, was, I won't, mm -hmm. won't take, I won't take too long here. Um, cause I, I've been told I, I speak too much. I need to let the guests speak more, uh, which I'm doing a good job of today. But, uh, in the, uh, I, I can't remember the exact figures, but I think it was like by step seven, you were already traveling at like seven or eight meters per second. Um, um I would say not even that, because if you look at, it's, it's probably more. Like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I meant by step two, you're already traveling. Yeah, That's... because, you know, by step five, step six, you're probably going to be at 10 meters. Yeah. At 10 meters, you're going to be hitting about 75% of VMAX, which for yeah. CJ is 12 meters per second. Yeah, sorry, by, step, by step two that you were almost at six, seven. Yeah, second. exactly. So within the first step, you're already outside of the velocity that you're ever going to see in the gym. Basically. And not, yeah, nothing you in the gym is going gonna, is gonna to transfer to that. Exactly. Or, 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 or what's the word I'm trying to um, Replicate that. 
Exactly. Contact time, block clearance is 350 milliseconds. Mm. By step, step one, it's, 16, it's 160 milliseconds. You know, you, that's way faster than even a counter movement jump. A counter movement jump is 250. And it's mm. like already you're, you're getting away from that. So it should be no surprise that you see no relationship between those two. Then if you look at the coordination, guys like Franz Bosch, Baz Van Horen, um, would say, well, running is, is isometric mm -hmm. or it's eccentric. It's basically just because you see movement externally in, or change of angle in the joint, it doesn't mean that there's anything changing in muscle length. Yeah. It might just be that the muscle is contracting and you see deformation of the tendon and then that you know, uh, applies force to the floor, floor returns energy and projects the athlete down the track. So mm. why should we expect to see uh, a concentric movement transfer to that if it's not uh, concentric but eccentric or isometric? Um, you know, contact times, all that kind of stuff. It, it should not be surprising. Yeah, yeah. So th there's, there's that. Um, so yes, I do think in, initially in the athlete's career, um, getting you know big, strong, and powerful in traditional movements will transfer to to sprinting. But certainly for our group, these were guys in their early twenties onwards, no relationship whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Then you have to start mm -hmm. to concentrate on stuff which does um, transfer more, which is going to be stuff is more like ballistic power, even assisted movements. You look at JB Marin, it's going to allow you to shift a little bit further on the force velocity curve to the velocities that you would see in sprinting. But yeah, again, yeah. like we just said, that's not enough. So you have to sprint. Sprinting is, people say, oh, what's your best exercise for getting faster? It's called sprinting. The trick is to do it with enough intensity, enough frequency, appropriate volume, uh, appropriate technique, all that kind of stuff. Um, See, the, the technique is the, is the huge issue because it happens so fast. It's just that most people just, it takes such a long coaching knife for that. But sorry, just one really quick thing I'm going to say, with, with that assignment that I did for my master's, it was to look at the dynamic correspondence between a power clean and um, the, uh, the, the sprint start. So as in the... And I bet you said, you said there's very, very little and they marked you down because it was St. Mary's. Uh, no, so, but it, <laughs> it, it was, it was uh, yeah, dynamic correspondence between a power clean with the... Um, sprint start but it was it was uh, to, you looked at both block clearance and like the first few steps mm -hmm. and main, mainly the, the the drive phase so block clearance in the first 10 meters but the, essentially yeah, the conclusion was that uh if you were a novice athlete there was a slightly more higher transfer but if you were yeah. intermediate to advanced there was like no correlation whatsoever the, o the only the only slight correlation in it was from the front leg and the blocks because the sequence, it's proximal to distal, as in it goes hip, uh, knee, ankle on the front leg. Mm -hmm. But most people's back leg, that's not the coordination of the joints. The knee actually usually triggers first. So there actually was no correlation between the, uh, the proximal to distal movement of a, of a power clean to the mm -hmm. rear leg. And then also like one of the core, one of the, the, criteria in dynamic correspondence is regime of muscular work and so like the clean for the most part is like mainly eight, you know well it is it's basically but concentric too and like so it only correlates to that first push off which listen could still have maybe some you know benefit you know benefit but yeah for the mm. overall for, for, for the overall takeaway like the summary of, of the of the findings was that if you're a novice athlete there may be some carryover but if you're advanced to elite, it's like there was no carb whatsoever. And even if you were a, a novice athlete, it would still fall under uh, GP, general preparatory exercise in terms of bonder chokes classifications. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's some really good work from James Wild and is it Bizardos? Neil Bizardos, I think is how, how you pronounce his name. They've got some good work on like power cleans. To, uh, well, Bizardos is good work on, on, on Olympus uh, acceleration. And then just James Wild's got great stuff on acceleration in general. So, but that, that was the conclusion from that. And uh, yeah, but yeah, seven meters by the second step. That's what I meant to say, just in case. But yeah, because yeah. when, when I saw that for the first time, I was like, Jesus, like, you're, like, because then, like, the whole, that's the first thing I was like, there's nothing we can do to replicate that. And as you said, like, going to get faster, you should just sprint. But again, as, as sorry as I interrupted there, it's, yeah. it's because most people's technique is just brutal. Yeah, so then, you know, you have to put a massive emphasis on this. My athletes, um, I would say, minim, you know, minimum of once a week, dedicated practice to learning how to run fast, ideally uh, to typically uh, one day dedicated to acceleration, one day dedicated to, uh, Vmax because they're, they're two different skills. Uh, I disagree with the statement that just because 90% of what they do in, in rugby is acceleration that we should only concentrate on acceleration. 
Yeah, I, I think I, that, I, disagree. I disagree with that as well. Like I don't like the other thing too is nobody is accelerating in a block position. So like even if like someone in rugby does travel ten meters by like four meters at ten meters, they actually are pretty upright already. Upright, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think just as a, a general mitigation of injury risk, learning how to sprint at top speed is probably going to be healthiest for your hamstrings. Uh, obviously, that's the riskiest thing, but with you know bigger risk comes bigger reward. I think increasing VMAX will drag acceleration in its wake. And I think it was picked away into research I was, recently. I was just about to say that to you too. Cause it, like, like, so like, that's another thing. Like if you say to people, well, like what about like, so in strength wise, like we know if we get our, our maximum strength up that so maximal loads become, you know, mm-hmm. easier in the system. It's the same then when it comes to, you know, getting your VMAX up in terms of acceleration. In terms of, again, like if you can get your VMAX up, then so your maximum velocity goes up, your operational loads now are even less of a sure. stress onto, onto your body. Your reserve goes up. And within, you know, inter individual within a team, everyone is pretty much going to arrive at the same percentage, more or less, of their VMAX by 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever. Mm. So if you've got a faster VMAX, you're going to be running faster when you get to that point. So exactly. exactly. You were going to say that about Peter Wayland? Well, that, I think that was the research. I mean, Cameron, Cameron cited it. I can't remember who it was, but I think that was basically what they demonstrated. They, they crunched the numbers and said, well, you know, if, you're, if your VMAX is faster, it's, it's not only going to make you faster at top speed, it's going to make you a better accelerator as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the, the progression that I would say to try and teach uh, motor learning, this is something that I've stolen from, from Chris Corfis, who I call Franz Bosch for people who care about numbers, uh, because Franz Bosch will just say, oh, you're wrong. And people say, well, where's your metal cabinet? And where are the numbers? And blah, blah, blah. So funny. And the cupboard is bare. Uh, but someone like... James was, John, J- James was still arguing against that, he would. Yeah, well, <laughs> John Pryor is, is another guy who's I think, has the numbers to, to, to back this up. I've spoken to him about that with regard to uh, looking at uh, peak accelerations in, in GPS and rugby. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Corfis, Tony Hollow, all that kind of stuff. He, he, Tony Hollow calls it record, rank, and publish. Yeah. Every every workout they do, it's it's there for everyone to see. Um, uh, Carl Valley, if you're not if you're not if you're not measuring, you're lying or something. If you're not, oh no, if you're not timing, you're lying. Um, so those guys, I think, would would agree that basically in in any movement skill and speed is the same. You're trying to cement the attractors, explore the fluctuators, and basically allow athletes to. Jeff Moore calls it hard, hard skill, soft skill. Always find the hard skill. Always find the stuff that never changes from rep to rep. Um, provide them with an environment they can deal with the fluctuators. That is the stuff that changes from every, you know, rep to rep. Very Nothing good. is the same in those in that regard. And where appropriate, once you've reached a certain level of mastery, you're going to in, increase the complexity of the task by adding in noise and variability um, to to force them to find those attractors. Mm. Um, what annoys me is when you see a team of unqualified rugby players and Graham Morris will talk about this because he normally sends me the clips losing his mind is a team of completely unqualified rugby players doing wickets from standing with a water bag on their shoulders yeah, well yeah. firstly wickets are a VMAX development tool because you're not trying to reinforce high heel recovery and acceleration mm-hmm. um, you've got props that you can't put one leg in front of the other without a water bag you know it, it's probably one for, for Instagram more than it is actually for development of athletes yeah. so I think what you have to do is like putting a grenade in the baby's hands. Exactly. Is, is cement, cement that technique with the simplest, least sexy tool possible until it doesn't work anymore. And then maybe look to introduce something else. And that's, that's typically what I would suggest with, with most athletes. So to give you an example, I, I've basically stolen this year, Chris Corpus progression for stuff like toe pop. So it would be start off with a double leg toe pop, and it would go, you know, normal arms, uh, arms folded, arms at shoulder height, arms overhead. Then it maybe go like uh, arms pressed overhead. Then it would go to, you know, small weight overhead, water bag or halo, something like that. And then you repeat that with um, alternating toe pop, single leg toe pop. Then you can add in stuff like changing surfaces, a bunch of different stuff. Mm. Five months in, they're just getting to the end of double leg toe pops. Because it, it, it didn't look good until until now. So yeah. that's that's a lot of progression right there. Then you remember that you know they're going to go on holidays and stuff like that. Techniques going to do this. There may be times that we regress. So you can you can stretch this stuff out for for multiple multiple years, um, and hopefully we're going to see um, increased transfer to to the field of play. Um, certainly, there's some some rewarding stuff. I think 
on the horizon. I hope it works out well. And I, I understand, of course, that young college athletes are still developing. But as an example, we have a field hockey girl who put two and a half inches on her vertical in, in three months. Hmm. And, and part of this, I think, was the speed stuff. And then obviously we have a, a jump progression. We have our agility progression, stuff like that. And the, the principles apply in agility as well. Um, I think, obviously, it's a lot more complex than, um, than speed development. The, you know, if we, if we imagine speed is just running in a straight line, that's very, yeah. very simple. There will be times when you have to make decisions and change direction, but then we're basically talking about agility. So in terms of learning the, the mechanics of change of direction, the principles are exactly the same. It's just the, the direction and the forces are different. Yeah. But then when you talk about agility, what you also have to consider is it's what people call a psychoperceptual motor skill. And one way that I've really changed my thinking, or not changed, but evolved my thinking about this is, is what's known as the OODA loop. So Colonel John Boyd was... Um, He's an uh, avi- aviator in the Korean War. Exactly. And, and Vietnam. So this is, I've wrote a blog post about this recently, but basically the, the more you can think about sport as warfare, the better, you, the better off you're going to be because sport, professional sport is like decades old. Warfare is thousands of years old. And we have a habit of if an idea doesn't work, it gets erased to history. Yeah, yeah. So warfare up until around World War I was basically a question of attrition and firepower. Uh, World War I, dig a trench, bring bigger guns than the other guy, throw as many bodies as you can at the problem, and eventually they'll be forced to give up. Problem with that is it comes at a ridiculous economic and human cost. Sport can be done the same way, and this is the South African rugby model. If we bring a bigger team than you, we're just going to run up the guts as hard as possible and try and break you, and eventually, hopefully, that will happen. Mm. But it comes at you know, massive cost um, in terms of fatigue and also player health. So as a result, they developed maneuver warfare and it, it became famous with the Germans in, in World War II. Blitzkrieg, Schwerpunkt, all this kind of stuff. And that is basically mm-hmm. trying to create uncontested opportunities because if I can create an opportunity where you're unprepared for me, you're unable to contest, I'm probably going to win that opportunity and then I just keep racking those up and I'm going to win the war. And same in sport. Should I try and run as hard as possible into you to try and knock you over to create space or should I try and use misdirection or speed or timing or confound you with a variety of different options that you have to attend to and force an error so that I have an uncontested opportunity and then I can just pass the ball to someone and put them through space or I can step or we can just move the ball to where you're not. And uncontested opportunities is basically what you're trying to create with Mm. agility. In attack, you're trying to create an uncontested opportunity and um, in defense, you're trying to get rid of those where you can contest because that's going to reduce the likelihood of success in the opposition team. Yeah. And John Boyd built upon this and created the OODA loop to try and formalize that model. And it basically says that you have to first observe your, your environment. You have to gather information via the senses. Then you have to orientate yourself, orient yourself, which is to process that information and derive meaning from it. Mm-hmm. Then you have to decide which is... Uh, in the orient phase, you're, you're synthesizing and analyzing. You're basically trying to run all these simulations in your head at massive, massive speed. If this, then this. If this, then this. You're just trying to select the best possible outcome or the best possible decision based on um, your culture, your personal style, your experience of the game, your strengths and weaknesses, all that kind of stuff. You make the, the decision that you want to make and then you act. You execute that movement and then obviously the loop keeps running. It's not that you just select your, your response and then you execute it. If you're a high-level athlete, you're constantly running that loop. And the idea goes that the faster you can run your loop relative to your opponent, uh, the greater your likelihood of success. So it wasn't necessarily in the Vietnam War that um, pilots that had the best planes survived. It was the ones that were able to run through the loop faster. And mm. his idea was that because they had more visibility overhead in the canopy, they were able to run through that loop. So if you see this in rugby, um, guys who are running faster OODA loops, for example, I step to the left, but I know I'm going to step to the right and I'm already moving right, but you're still running your loop, assuming that I'm going to the left. Mm -hmm. That's an example. So bearing that in mind, you have to train all of those aspects in agility to fully equip an athlete with the highest possible chances of success. So you have to generate their, or you have to develop their ability to process their environment via the senses. And when we talk about that, we're typically talking about the eyes. Yes, touch, hearing, all that kind of stuff, probably not taste, is gonna take place in rugby, but the primary 
way that we gather information via the senses in rugby is the eyes. Mm -hmm. So then we can look at different kinds of vision, uh, making sure that we have the right kind of acuity. We're able to track objects and fix objects on the retina and stuff like that. And that's where I've dipped a toe this year. And I'm trying to understand better how we can um, train that stuff. But at the very least, if you have the resources, you should make sure that every single athlete in your team gets their eyes tested and they have the right prescription if they need it. Mm -hmm. Because our, our model of reality is generated by the senses. And if the senses are flawed, you have generated a flawed model of reality, which then informs your ability to process that information, make a decision and execute. Mm -hmm. very so good. then you're into Orient. And what you're looking to do is process that information. And the way that you do that is you, you basically repetitions under the belt, experience in the game. You are not going to know what the likelihood of success is unless you've been in that situation before uh, you've tried something before, you know what works, you know what doesn't work, you know what your personal style is, you know what um, the style of your opposition is. So either you've trained against those guys or you've done film or stuff like that and you understand what the culture of the team is and you understand, uh, you know, for example, in Argentina, you see a gap, that's an opportunity to run and try and score a try. In South Africa, you see a gap, you ignore it, you put your head down and run. I'm taking a piss, but it informs the decision that gets made. Yeah, yeah. And what you have to do is shape the learning environment to provide athletes with the opportunity to discover all that kind of stuff. If all you do is close ladder drills or every time they fuck up, you blow the whistle, you're not providing athletes with the opportunity to learn what works and what doesn't work. Mm. And then you get into making decisions. So I would say you mentioned it already with dynamic systems learning theory. Uh, the athlete obviously is going to affect what their individual style is, what they're good at, what they're not good at, what their preferences are. Um, the environment, so where they are on the pitch, all that kind of stuff will, will affect the outcome. But then also, it's our job as the, the coach to shape the task so that we, we have to put them in, in an environment or a scenario where they have to do what we want them to do. But it's not you have to tell them and push them through the door. You just open the door and kind of guide them through. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, we have to execute that movement and mechanical efficiency and teaching them uh, the movement patterns that underpin that kind of stuff is a part of it and it, it needs to be done, but it's by no means a distinguishing characteristic between elite and sub elite. It tends to be the first three letters of that OODA loop. And ultimately it's the, the Orient um, building that knowledge of the game and being able to process information uh, quickly. Hmm. But you know, you have to have all four of those in, in a program to develop um, what I would consider to be world-class agility. And so it's, it's observe, orientate, decide, act. Is that the four? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Process, um, gather, gather information via the senses, process that information, select the best possible response based on all the previous factors we talked about, and then execute in game context. It, it really makes you think about, you know, we speak so much about screen and movement the last 10, 15 years. It's like, what are people doing for the sensory systems? And it's funny yeah. you mentioned vision is something that I've been, I've been thinking an awful lot about lately. Ever since I spoke to Jeff Meyer on my podcast last year. Yeah, I got it for Jeff. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and he got it from um, slowthegamedown.com. Yeah, the, the the Harrisons is that there in Doctor Harrison? Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah, it's uh, it's definitely been on my radar. And then obviously talking to you know Chris Corfus uh, and Dan Victor, um, very big and like Victor's using the eyes, like massive in the eyes, and it makes sense. You know, I mean, there's such a massive input or system. It always makes me think like, what? How do blind people make up for that? Because because he, I done a lot of research in circadian rhythms. Like, uh, like mm -hmm. I love circadian biology, and everyone talks about like the major circadian regulator is our dark and light cycles. Along them, you know, temperature would then follow that. But mainly, it's our dark and light cycles. And I was like, I always want to ask the sleepy researchers, what the fuck do the blind people do? And also, how do they know when to stop wiping their ass? <laughs> <laughs> so if we have any, if we have any blind uh, listeners, you can you can tell us. Yeah, that. thanks. Apologies. Um, no, but yeah, vision is, a bit, and it's funny because I actually heard Dan Victor say that on Joel Smith's podcast uh, Just Fly Performance which is a fantastic podcast um, big shout out to Joel great guy too uh, but Victor said that he said he, he goes on the podcast what's the, what's the muscles we we, we train we under train the most and everyone's like oh the glutes or blah or whatever it is you know? and he's like it's the ice we never train ice and he's right too he made a good point he's like you know we all know if we put our, our broken arm in a cast or our leg in a cast and it just stays there it fixates and he's like how many people just have their eyes straight all day he's like when do you actually like go to the periphery and train your eyes. And it made so much sense. And this is the thing, you know, Jeff says, it's, it's not like stand across the room and read that 
read that chart across the room. Mm. What it is, is, okay, I'm going to open up your favorite book and pin it to the wall. And I want you to read it out loud whilst you're doing jumping jacks. Yeah. And now imagine somebody's trying to take your head off. That's how precise vision in sport has to be. And anecdotally, I heard secondhand via an athlete of his, Coco Vanderway, who's one of the top female tennis players in the USA. Um, they do an exercise with basically it's um, bead string. So there's beads going down the string and basically you have to try and converge your eyes to focus on the bead and create one image. Mm. And the closer it gets, the harder it gets, the further away it gets, the harder it gets. And yeah. apparently she was able to perfectly fix an image of this bead from like across the room. Amazing. And that's obviously physically she's an elite athlete, but it draws attention to that. This is an area that most coaches don't even consider. And if the eyes are a muscle, muscles can be trained. So that we're maybe missing a trick here of, of low hanging fruit and stuff that we can, we can train. And again, anecdotally from my experience, Corey Jane, he's retired now. So I'll talk about him. This guy is, uh, was good, but not remarkable as a winger. So he would be getting kind of a, a one six, maybe just under in the peak of his career for a 10 meter time. Not particularly heavy. He was 92 kilos, like low nineties strength, Good, not amazing. There would be other wingers stronger than him, but this guy's ability to just snap his fingers and, and execute decision or process his environment and also his, his ability to strategize. One of the most intelligent athletes I've ever worked with. I never beat him in a game of cards. And you think well, that's not even specific to what he does for a living. You, you take that mentality and put it into rugby. This guy was untouchable in terms of his, his intelligence for the game and his knowledge of the game. Yeah, great stuff. Well, we're coming short on time. You've got 13 minutes and then you've got to go beat the shit out of people at Jiu-Jitsu, as you told me. So uh, we'll get into power. Um, and if that's as far as we'll get, listen, we'll, we'll sort out a part two and we'll get you back on. Because I'm, I'm always more, I prefer like, to, to have like multiple podcasts where we can get deep down and like, you know, have sure. to rush. And, oh, I just have to do the quick fire round and ask all these questions. And then you're like, oh, the podcast is going well. Then you went into your shitty questions that no one wants to hear. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Of course. Uh, so power, right? Uh, again, similar to myself, a lot of similar um, views. I think there's a lot of emotion and um what would your, your word be there i suppose just yeah there's a lot of uh, emotional and sub subjectivity when it comes to developing power in terms of certain means that people say need to always be done so i'll let you uh, take the reins on this i think you're referring to olympic lifting um <coughs> <laughs> good leading um what what is special about olympic lifting nothing unique there are some things that work well about Olympic lifting. And that is that any, any traditional up and down weightlifting where you finish like this, like in a bench or a squat, by definition, you are finishing with zero velocity. That means there is a phase of deceleration of the load, which means you're producing less force, not more. Mm -hmm. um, that is not good when you're trying to maximize force production and, and project the body or project uh, an implement or impart force to an opponent. So, um, an exercise like an Olympic lift variation is useful because the only deceleration that occurs is the, the load due to gravity. So you're applying more and more force. You've essentially cut out that inherent deceleration. Um, triple extension of the hip, knee and ankle um, on the field of play is a highly applicable movement because we use it when we, uh, when we jump, when we sprint, although extension is not complete, uh, when we change direction, when we, when we hit people. So if we can, if we can train that movement pattern, um, we're hopefully going to see more transfer to the field of play. What do you see in an Olympic lift when it's executed well is triple extension. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of exercises out there that train triple extension under load with no inherent deceleration, namely ballistic jump variations or heavy med ball throws and stuff like that. And the benefit is um, that they don't require nearly the amount of teaching to to perfect. I can teach someone how to do a trap bar jump in 30 seconds. Whereas if you go to a weekend course of strength and conditioning coaches learning how to Olympic lift, whose motivation is off the charts compared to their athletes, the best you're going to get is a half fucking sumo squat reverse curl with a broomstick after 16 hours of learning in the company of other coaches being coached in small groups. Mm -hmm. Now you take that to a, a group of 30 athletes, you've got 15 minutes and none of them give a fuck what they do. It's probably not going to be pretty. And People say, well, don't you think we owe it to the, uh, to the athletes to teach them Olympic lifting because they're going to have to do X, Y, Z in their career? It's like, no, we don't owe it to the athletes. 
we owe it to the athletes to make them better. It's like, we're not in the Olympic lifting business. We're in the gold medal business. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And if it, if it transfers to the field of play, one thing that I didn't touch on as well is that there, there appears to be an inherent limitation in the Olympic lifts, the clean and the snatch, whereby if you don't hit a certain velocity, you're not going to be able to complete the lift. Mm. And it's just useful that the, the clean tends to correspond to strength speed zones as outlined by Brian Mann in his, in his book on VBT and the snatch tends to correspond to um, speed strength. So it's, it's useful that if you do those exercises, well, you're probably going to fall in those um, velocity zones and that, but that's, you know, it's a, it's a big if. But again, those velocities, like going back to what we spoke about with the, with, with the velocities coming out of the blocks, I mean, there's still no comparison. Exactly. So, and, and the direction's completely different. I mean, they're coming at the blocks here going horizontally, whereas that's vertical. Bingo. Even though I know John Goodwin um, has stated that, and you don't necessarily need to do Olympic lifts to develop this, but greater, uh, greater leg extension force does allow someone to have a greater ability to overcome gravity, which then, like to overcome the vertical force of gravity, which then allows them to actually project horizontally more because basically they, ha- they have more reserve in their capacity. Like if, if your lower body is stronger at developing lower leg extension force more quickly, you are more able to withstand the vertical direction of force, which then allows you more of a buffer to push horizontally. So that, that was one, just one example that he gave. And he was like, you know, Olympic lifting can be a useful means. It's not the only way, but that was, was just... Yeah, I mean, my, my retort to that would be compared to what? Yeah. Um, I had I this conversation with, uh, with James Collins, who's at Sporting KC. He right, yeah, sure, yeah. Right. I know James well, man. I know yeah, James. yeah, so... Me myself, and James. myself and Mr. Boyle got him into Springfield. Oh, there you go. So me and JC went for a beer in 2015 and we were talking about this and I said, well, I'll, I'll bet you a tenner right now. I said, if you took a program that removed inherent deceleration, that had triple extension in the load and you velocity matched it to an Olympic lift, hmm. that exercise would outperform the Olympic lift in terms of uh, transfer to the field of play. And he did it for his master's thesis and it turns out a trap bar jump is more effective uh, than a power clean in development of... Um, vertical jump and sprint speed Hmm. now this is in the american collegiate system where olympic lifts cure cancer and those athletes have been doing those for their entire probably high school and definitely their college career Hmm. and you see that enhanced transfer in in, um, ballistic lifts um there is more and more research coming out all the time i literally had a a conversation on twitter this week i forget the name of the researcher so my apologies but if you if you go into my thread and dan house's thread it you know it's mentioned so the research is there so yeah yeah um there's nothing special about olympic lifts there is just some things which are useful and if you can if you can replicate those with other exercises that entail more cost for sorry more benefit for less cost it's probably in, in your interest to use those but like i say to everyone you're welcome to use whatever exercises you want you can do whatever you want if your numbers are better than mine i'm going to pay attention to still what you do and if they're not i'm not hmm. And um, I, th- I don't think you can marry yourself to any particular exercise. So, what do what do you personally then like to use for power development? I I, I know I've heard you speak about this, but just for the audience, like, so you, um, you're more a fan of the ballistic methods. Yeah, jump squat, um, jump squat variations. So occasionally we'll do you know, split squat variations, um, uh, push jerks, bench throws, power rows, speed deadlifts, uh, trap bar jumps, all that kind of stuff. Hmm. different variations and the, uh, the progression that i'm talking about right now i've put in this webinar that i mentioned to you is um generally we're going to start with body weight because most athletes have never done anything ballistic let alone with external load and if it's not necessary to use external load we're not going to do it mm-hmm. plus we want to cement that technique earn the right to use um heavy loads development work capacity so the first phase tends to be body weight how are you deciding on loads there? Are you are you taking a percentage of like a one or m in a lift or like how, how are you decide as that? a guide as a guide um vbt is is not without um without flaw and you know speaking to maladin has con- convinced me more of that it, it's it's kind of like a guide yeah. um we'll we'll try and look at things like peak velocity making sure we're in kind of certain ra- ranges or look at power output the thing about power output is is you have to factor in system mass and it can be difficult to calculate that on the fly when you've got a lot of athletes so yeah, i tend to yeah. peak velocity because that doesn't change 
Um, but definitely once you've kind of managed body weight, then we would go into non counter movement variations. And the reason for that one is looking at what Franz Bosch and Baz Van Horen have talked about with slack. If there is something there, we're going to remove a little bit of slack from the system. Another thing is, is that without that sudden counter movement or dropping down into the floor, there's less activation of the stress shortening cycle. There's less impact to the tissues. It's generally less fatiguing. Um, so we'll, we'll do that. Then we'll progress to counter movement. So we're increasing those factors that I just talked about. And then we'll go into what Caldeets would call antagonistically facilitated shock method. Um, I just call it drop reps. For drop sake, reps. Oh. Yeah, oh. so basically creating some hang time or, or flight time in the air where you actively let go of the, the load. If, if I imagine a bench press throw, I actually let go, drop, catch, and reverse. Or if I'm doing a, uh, a jump squat variation, it would be the, the same principle. And that's because think, we're going to get massive. Think, so, yes. I th think there's a clip of you doing an exercise like that. The, 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 the seminar you recently did with Maladin, I think there's a clip of you doing that with some exercise. Yeah. And that was, you know, kind of, that was one of the presentations that I did for that group in Argentina, which is, that's the progression that we, we'll use thereafter because of the, we're increasing those variables we talked about, more stress. Mm -hmm. and, and then we're going to finish off with kind of like a peaking um, of the assisted stuff that JB Marin talks about with uh, assisted squat jump variations, assisted clap push-ups, all that kind of stuff. Lethal. Uh, just to kind of um, a taper, put the icing on the cake, try and get towards those, those higher velocities. And you have to remember as well, we're not doing this in isolation. We're still sprinting. We're still doing all that kind of stuff. So it's just yeah. a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, so there, there's that. And I think that there's different things that we're going to do throughout the year that tends to be, um, I would say, I've got into isometric holds a lot more. So uh, isometric holds for long durations, then going into drop isometrics. So similar to the, the drop reps, but we drop down, put the brakes on, hold for say three to five seconds, then come back up. Um, and then finishing off with uh, oscillatory isometrics, which look like having an epileptic fit, but I believe there's split, something there. Split squat position in those? Uh, we, we do it with everything. So yeah. we'll do it with military presses, bench presses, chin-ups, rows, um, split squats. We do what I call a Chinese plank variation for the glutes. We do... Um, and what are, you, what are you noticing as a benefit? Like what is... Like what's... What is the benefit of those? Like, what are you seeing as benefit? Is it the athletes are allowed, like their 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 power puts are getting better? Or like, um, I've had this discussion with Victor and with uh, Max Myers or Matt Van Dyke. Like, yeah. like what do they think is going? On? Again, it goes back to this sort of like, you know, goggy tendon organ spindle. You're dampening down. I'll put, put my hand up. I don't know. It yeah. Appears, as a whole, it appears to be working. And um, my rationale to use it would be that something through the nervous system, anyway. I, what I believe it is, is so like you talked about with sprinting, sprinting happens so fast. Mm. It's a hundred milliseconds at VMAX more or, less, or 80 to hundred milliseconds. Yeah, so that's even, yeah, yeah. Let's say, you know, we're sub elite and it's going to be around a hundred in, yeah. in field based sports. If you look at Paul Bryce and Peter Wayne at SMU, the first 50% of ground contact is going to be the difference between elite and sub elite because you have this double peak of, of vertical force. Yeah, yeah. So if it's that first half, it goes down to 40 to 50 milliseconds. That's all you've got to make the difference in um, projecting yourself down the track faster than the other guy. Yeah. So that is not enough time to think, hmm, I'm going to contact the floor. I better put my foot on the, on the gas now. What you have to do is attack the floor from that end swing phase, build up as much speed as possible and pre-tension your limb to be able to impart that force isometrically. Mm. So there's, and then what you have to do is because Stuart McMillan calls it the paradox of muscle contraction, M muscular tension, muscular force creates movement, but it also slows down movement. Yeah. Yeah. Because the muscles, the idea of agonist on one side working antagonist on the other side, not working doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's basically muscles on all sides of the body contracting at once. Yeah. So the, the paradox is, is it actually slows you down. So, he calls it the double pulse um, in, in kicking, uh, golfing, uh, punching, all that kind of stuff. There has to be a pulse of force to create motion, yeah. a period of relaxation to allow that high speed movement to occur, and then another pulse of force in the striking sports, he calls it a maximum effective mass. So you're mm -hmm. trying to hit someone with the mass of your whole body by tensing your body at once. When you run, you're trying to tense your entire limb to be as stiff as possible and um, apply as much energy as uh, much force as possible into the floor. And then that, the floor returns the energy and projects you mm. uh, along. So elite performance in high speed movements 
appears to be underpinned by the ability to generate a huge amount of tension, whole body tension, as quickly as possible, apply it for an instant, and then switch off as quickly as possible. Yeah. And if you look at oscillatory isometrics, that's basically the ability that you're training to do it's, because uh, yeah. progressing from isometric holds for long duration to drop reps to oscillatory isometrics, the amount of force that you're having to generate increases the amount of time that you're having to hold it for decreases and the speed that you have to switch between those contraction types decreases with each phase so my hope is that um let's say you do a traditional program of you, you know address your asymmetries working your weak points initially then you're going to just traditional up and down stuff then you maybe do some ballistic stuff to address rate of force development then you go to isometrics then you go to drop isos then you go to oscillate your isometrics you've hopefully addressed all of the limiting factors that could be an issue um, in not allowing you to run fast or jump as high as possible or change direction or hit as hard as possible. Because if you think about all those phases there, we've hopefully got rid of the mechanical efficiencies. We've increased F max, but although it takes half a second to a second to produce, it's not going to have the best transfer. Mm. And we've looked at, okay, well, let's see if we can increase the rate of force development. Then we've looked at, okay, yeah, we're going to increase rate of force development and then we're going to try and train a contraction type which is specific and an angle which is specific to the key movements on the field of play. Yeah. Then we're going to look at the ability to put the brakes on super fast and get into that and get out of that contraction type. And then we're going to do that at speed. And then hopefully that's just all the pieces come together. Yeah, it's fucking great stuff. Uh, I know you're <clears throat> ready to rock and roll there. Um, I do great podcasts with, with uh, Mark Schmall, Mark, Max, Max Smarjo. Sorry, Max. And, Just say strong by science. <laughs> yeah. No, I do great podcasts with Max and, and Matt. And um, in their in their latest book, I Smetch for Performance, they actually spoke about, you know, they, they actually do a lot in their program with, with long duration isometrics. But they also spoke about the benefits of the tendon from isometrics and that actually it isn't so much rate of force, but rate of transmission that improves through the tendon. Yep. Um, which was very, very interesting. And then just going back to that idea of, you know, contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation, like, you know, it's like, what's going on there? Is it like calcium coming in and out of the soccer pads you're taking on like back and forth and the rates faster and all that. And I was actually saying that, like someone said something to do with like mitochondria as well. Like, you know, if you've got more mitochondria, you can do, you can, your rate of that's faster to relax. I remember Joel Jameson said it, but like no one's ever given like some sort of reason behind it. And Max said he was in a library one day <laughs> and he came across this, book and it was actually he said this is what he said, he said it was actually called translated russian sports science and he said he went through it as he would because he's a fucking nerd hank, hank kreinhoff did that he uh, did high intensity continuous training for a 100 meter sprinter yeah for that reason for that reason and then uh, but Matt max was saying that um that it was in that so uh okay yeah, yeah so max schmarzo what a great name i said it to the two guys i was like max schmarzo matt van dyke it's like movie star names and here's me with my just fucking standard irish name <laughs> It's actually uh, French Normandy, I believe. But uh, uh, I've no French time. I'm talking. We're going back generations here. But but apparently the the the, the French Normans became more Irish than the Irish themselves. That's what we were told in history class. Well, apparently one of the reasons there's so many dark-haired people in Ireland as well is that when um, England and Spain had the the Battle of the Armada in the English Channel, uh, the the boats that managed to survive from the Spanish Armada sailed west and it landed on the coast of Galway. <laughs> apparently. How do you explain all the redheads then? Oh, well, there's only, there's only two, um, two like, uh, ethnic groups of people in the world that have red hair. One is uh, Celts and the other is uh, Jewish people. No way. There yeah. you go. What a way to end the episode. Uh, that's savage stuff, so it is. Um, do, just one other thing there. We, we were talking about like the, the ground contact real quick. I know there's a really good paper by JB on like a, a comparing you know, elite sprinters to sub-elite and this idea that the elite, they break less and push more. That's actually the name of the paper, I think. It's like, that's, it's in mm -hmm. the title that like break less, push more, but it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, and this idea of the co-contraction. I, I know that Van Buren and Bosch speak about, you know, again, that when the leg is hitting the ground, it's actually an isometric moment and that the Agnes and Agnes are actually co-contracting. Some people would say eccentric, some people would say isometric, but I think- Quasi, no, quasi isometric. Whatever. Nobody is saying it's concentric. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, true enough. Listen, we're definitely going to get you back on because we still got to go through strength. I love your thoughts on max strength and God. our favorite one, energy systems, baby. Energy That's systems. Uh, we'll get Buddy Morris on on that too. Why are you doing 300? That just makes no sense. It, it goes on. It goes <laughs> on. So listen, uh, yeah, I'll wrap this up here and then I'll say good luck to you offline. So for the listeners and viewers, you know the story. I always say thanks a million. Uh, keep sharing these out if you can. Subscribe on iTunes. Subscribe on the YouTube channel. From me, Robbie Burke of Opex Fitness, where, of course, the fitness, as you can see, is explained. And from...
You can say goodbye there. Oh, <laughs> cheers. Thanks. <laughs> From Kier. All right. Take care. I'll have everything in the show notes about Kier's website, his Facebook, his Twitter, so you can, can contact him if you want. Um, but for now, take care. See you guys.